Well, let's get across the market open now. Daniel Ortiz joining us from Stock Doctor. Daniel, great to catch up with you on this Wednesday. Goodness, um, take a look at what happened yesterday in the wake of the well, that the, the chief Chinese economic planner stepping up to a huge expectations, obviously, because the market response was quite savage. The disappointment there. Yeah, it was oh, good to be back with you, Andrew, but it was crazy trading yesterday at around one o'clock. I mean, everyone in the office was kind of monitoring the ASX and even monitoring the overseas markets, what were happening. And there was a lot of volatility, wasn't there? And particularly in those resources names and obviously the iron ore contracts traded down pretty heavily as well due to the fact that there was really no new major stimulus announced. And, you know, I think that was kind of along the lines of our thinking, uh, you know, they just obviously announced quite quite a few uh, stimulus measures. And then it was more about, you know, talking about sovereign bond issuances and further supporting the economy. But obviously nothing new announced just for now. But uh, yeah, expectations in markets can be really rife, can't they? They can indeed. So, Daniel, of course, we have seen, you know, in response to that, uh, that stim- those stimulus measures that have already been announced, uh, commodities have run very hard. We've seen that translate to those resource stocks uh, listed locally too. A uh, bit of a pullback yesterday, as you've noted. Um, more broadly, how are you seeing that play out at the moment? Yeah, look, it's something that we certainly are a little bit tepid on. And we did mention this on the call podcast as well yesterday, Andrew. But, you know, I think it is still a little bit too early to be calling any significant rotation or change in sentiment for the resource stocks as a a broad group, because we haven't seen a recovery, of course, just as yet in the real economy, particularly in China. And we know that that is going to be the major driver of demand for a lot of commodities and resources. So, look, my concern is that the markets move quickly, as we do in financial markets, positioning you know from from a top-down point of view has changed quite dramatically obviously the market in particular in australia was underweight heavily resources so to move the dial money has to flow quickly you know my concern is that it probably looks a little bit overdone we've actually had you know iron ore go from below 90 dollars to over 120 in trading it's such a small uh, number of days now sitting back to 110 i still think that the risks are kind of skewed to the downside in a backdrop where especially in the larger end of the town andrew mining equity valuations look quite full to me so look i think there's a little bit of room for caution at the moment i'm probably not as optimistic um on you know a, a really strong recovery as perhaps some others out there in the market and let's wait and see what the data comes to from the real economy because that will be the be all end all for, for resource demand well, Daniel, let's uh, drill down a, a couple of individual stocks to see how they have performed. Of course, Rio has been in the news, not the least, of course, because of its, uh, its bid for Arcadium. Um, how, are you, how are you seeing where Rio is at the moment, obviously given iron ore, but also obviously its play for uh, lithium? Yeah, look, it's going to be really interesting, Andrew, and fortunately, we have quarterly reporting season ahead of us. So, look, I'm very, I'm going to be watching very closely to see what further information the company is giving on the deal, but also the comments around markets in China, because obviously these two large companies provide a lot of detail in those quarterly reports. So, you know, we know that Rio probably hasn't been as highly or hasn't made as many acquisitions as BHP in recent years. Obviously, that the balance sheet is certainly representative of that very clean balance sheet at the moment. And the company and certainly its management team at the last few reports have been talking about, you know, we want to do deals, but effectively, we don't want to make a significant large splash. So the size of Arcadium, you know, even smaller than the deal for BHP and Oz Minerals, you know, I think is probably makes sense. But we want to see here more details about why they're interested, because, you know, I think you know the market and consensus analysts all agree that Arcadia might not really be considered a tier one assortment of assets. But certainly as a group, it does have a large production base and large upside with development projects. But, you know, are those projects the scale and quality for a Rio Tinto or a BHP? I think that's still up in question. So what are they looking to buy? Is it purely exposure? Is it purely just a call option? on future development and capacity, or is it more the technical aspect and expertise? We know that Rio has been looking to develop and hire their technical team in lithium in Argentina, exploring that DLE or direct lithium extraction technology. That's something that Liven in particular, now Arcadium has, you know, in its business for a long time. So just more details around that strategy is what I'm really keen to hear about, Andrew. Daniel, elsewhere, mineral resources, um, look, it's uh, taking a look at share price, uh, severely depressed there. 
Um, and that's because, of course, we've seen both um, iron ore and lithium come off substantially, but it's, it, it, it is a diversified miner. It's also got um, a stake in gas as well. What are you seeing there? Oh, I think this is going to be the, the quarterly report of the season for, for this quarter and the one really that you can't afford to miss because there's so much going on at Mineral Resources. They're in the paper every week at the moment talking about obviously some of the issues they had on the financial leverage side. But, you know, last report they put out, they, they actually put out a, a few measures reducing costs, reducing CapEx, trying to, you know, appease to the market's concerns on their debt. They obviously had the completion of their whole road sale down as well. So I'm really keen to hear about, you know, how the company's thinking about their capital management efficient, uh, initiatives right now. And like you mentioned, that they've been flagging a potential sell down in their onshore gas assets, you know, in, in Western Australia. You know, there's been reports that Mitsui is potentially interested. Yeah, I think a lot of water has to go under the bridge there. So, you know, one thing I'm watching very closely in particular, or two things actually, is obviously the performance of the Onslow ramp up. That, that's going to be the be all end all for Minres right now. It's the reason why they've got so much debt. They've invested three billion in this in this project. You know, they actually gave guidance, which was ahead of market expectations in terms of ramp up performance. So that that's going to be a huge driver of market sentiment. And the second thing I'm watching out is, you know, what happens at Mount Marion? Their partner Gangfeng is obviously starting up the major lithium mine in Africa, the, the Gulamina mine um, in, in Mali. So, you know, what does that mean for Mount Marion uh, and their offtake and their partnership with Gang Feng? A lower concentrate, lower grade mine. You know, really keen to see what happens there as well. And Daniel, let's get across what we're seeing in the gold sector at the moment. The gold price, uh, well, it actually came off um, around 1% overnight on those expectations, which have been lowered now, just as far as uh, what sort of rate cuts we're gonna get out of the States, which um, uh, obviously, we're looking at smaller cuts because of that economic strength we're seeing. More broadly, though, when you take a look at the Aussie gold stocks and their performance and it's the cost of how they get that ore out of the ground and so on, how are you seeing it? Yeah, well, there's only really been a handful of companies in the gold space to really take advantage of the rise in gold price and extract significant free cash flow. You know, a quick example is we've seen Bromelius generate significant free cash in recent periods. But the question is, when are all the other companies going to join the party? A lot of them have large growth projects that they're sinking a lot of money into. Obviously, Evolution and Northern Star, you know, have had their their own, you know, internal growth projects that they've obviously been focusing on, on quite intensely. So my question to the gold space is, you know, you've you've been dealing with very high gold prices for over 12 months now. Who's going to be using this to, to generate cash? And therefore, what, what's that going to lead to? What type of strategic initiatives are going to come from this? Is it M&A and reserve replacement? Is it growth? Is it capital management, share buybacks, potentially dividends? So it's a very kind of a, it's going to be a quarter of, of show me the money in my eyes, Andrew. And who's going to be the best performers? You know, we've liked certainly Capricorn and Perseus. They've generated a lot of cash. Mark has rewarded those companies. And now I'm looking to who's next in that space or, you know, who's going to be conducting some interesting initiatives potentially on the M&A front.